examples. Now for Remembrance Sunday, the pity of war. First June, 1916. Our draft left Waterloo for Southampton and we marched through London with bands to say goodbye. Thus we came in for a deal of cheering and staring from windows and pavements. Down the close, darkening lanes they sang their way to the siding shed and lined the train with faces grimly gay. Then. Unmoved, signals nodded, and a lamp winked to the guard. So secretly, like wrongs hushed up, they went. They were not ours. We never heard to which front these were sent. January the 1st, 1917, France. My own dearest mother, I have just received orders to join the 2nd Manchester's at Etaples. This is a regular regiment, so I've come off mighty well. There is a fine, heroic feeling about being in France, and I'm in perfect spirits. I shall actually be at the front. 9th January, 2nd Manchester Regiment. British Expeditionary Force. I have not been at the front. I've been in front of it. I held an advance post. That's a dugout in the middle of no man's land. We had a march of three miles over shelled roads, then nearly three along a flooded trench. After that, we came to where the trenches had been blown flat out we had to go over the top. It was, of course, dark. Too dark. And the ground was not mud, not sloppy mud, but an octopus of sucking clay, three, four, and five feet deep, relieved only by craters full of water. Men have been known to drown in them. 
many stuck in the mud and only got on by leaving their waders, equipment and in some cases their clothes. High explosives were dropping all around and machine guns splattered every few minutes. But it was so dark that even the German flares didn't reveal us. Three quarters dead. I mean, each of us. Three quarters dead. We reached the dugout. We'd found an old Bosch dugout. And he knew and gave us hell. For shell on fantic shell hammered on top, but never quite burst through rain, guttering down in waterfalls of slime kept slush waist high and rising hour by hour and choked the steps too thick with clay to climb. What murk of air remained, stank old and sour with fumes of whiz -bangs, and the smell of men who'd lived there years and left their curse in the den if not their corpses. There we heard it from the blast of whiz -bangs. But one found our door at last, buffeting eyes and breath, snuffing the candles. And thud, flump, thud. Down the steep steps came thumping and sploshing in the flood deluging muck, the sentry's body. Then his rifle, handles of old Bosch bombs and mud in ruck on ruck. We dredged him up for killed until he whined. Sir, my eyes are blind. I'm blind, I'm blind. Coaxing, I held a flame against his lids and said if he could see the least blurred light, he was not blind. In time, he'd get all right. I can't. He sobbed. Eyeballs, huge, bulged like squids, watch my dream still. But I forgot him there, in posting next for duty, and sending a scout to beg a stretcher somewhere, and floundering about to other posts under the shrieking air. Those other wretches, how they bled and spewed, and one who would have drowned himself for good. I try not to remember these things now. Let dread hark back for one word only. How half listening to that sentry's moans and jumps and the wild chattering of his broken teeth renewed most horribly whenever crumps pummeled the roof and slogged the air beneath. Through the dense din, I say we heard him shout I see your lights! But ours had long died out. Sixteenth January. There is a terrific strafe on. Our artillery are doing a 48 hours bombardment. At night, it is like a stupendous thunderstorm, for the flashes are quite as bright as lightning. One slight disadvantage. There's a howitzer just 70 or 80 yards away, firing over the top every minute. Be slowly lifted up, thou long black arm, great gun. 
towering towards heaven about to curse. Sway steep against them and for years rehearse huge imprecations like a blasting charm. Reach at that arrogance which needs thy harm and beat it down before its sins grow worse. Spend our resentment, cannon, yea, disperse our gold in shapes of flame, our breaths in storm. Yet for men's sakes, whom thy vast malice must wither innocent of enmity, be not withdrawn, dark arm, thy spoilier done, safe to the bosom of our prosperity. But when thy spell be cast complete and whole, may God curse thee and cut thee from our soul. Fourth February, Advanced Horse Transport Depot. I have no mind to describe all the horrors of this last tour, but it was almost worse than the first, because in this place my platoon had no dugouts, but had to lie in the snow under the deadly wind. By day it was impossible to stand up, or even crawl about, because we were behind only a little ridge screening us from the Bosch's periscope. Tommy's cookers between the platoon, but they didn't suffice to melt the ice in the water cans, so we suffered cruelly from thirst. The marvel is that we do not all die of cold. As a matter of fact, only one of my party froze to death. I suppose I can endure cold and fatigue and the face-to-face -face death as well as another. But extra for me, there is the universal pervasion of ugliness. All are devil-ridden. Everything's unnatural, broken, blasted. The distortion of the dead, whose unburiable bodies sit outside the dugouts all day, all night. The most execrable sights on earth. In poetry we call them the most glorious. But to sit with them all day, all night, and a week later to come back and find them still sitting there in motionless groups. Already, I have comprehended a light which will never filter into the dogma of any national church. That one of Christ's essential commands was passivity at any price. It can only be ignored. But I think pulpit professionals are ignoring it very skillfully and successfully indeed. If they made the great objection, I should admire them. They have not the courage. And I'm not myself a conscientious objector with a very seared conscience. Christ is literally in no man's land. There men often hear his voice. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Is it spoken in English only?
February. A Company, my cellar. Immediately after I sent my last letter, we were rushed back into the line. Twice in one day we went over the top, gaining both our objectives. The sensations of going over the top are about as exhilarating as those dreams of falling over a precipice when you see the rocks at the bottom surging up to you. I woke up. Some didn't. There was an extraordinary exaltation in the act of slowly walking forward, showing ourselves open. There was no bugle and no drum, for which I was very sorry. I kept up a kind of chanting sing-song. Keep the line straight. Not so fast on the left. Steady on the left. Not so fast. Then we were caught in a tornado of shells. The various waves were all broken up, and we carried on like a crowd moving onto a cricket field. When I looked back and saw the ground all crawling and wormy with wounded bodies, I felt no horror at all, but only an immense exultation at having got through the barrage. The reward we got for all this was to remain in the line twelve days. For twelve days I didn't wash my face, or take off my boots, or sleep a deep sleep. For twelve days we lay in crater holes, where at any moment a shell might put us out. I think the worst incident was one wet night when we lay up against a railway embankment. A big shell lit on the top of the bank, just two yards from my head. Before I awoke, I was blown in the air right away from the bank, and passed most of the following days in a hole just big enough to lie in, and covered with corrugated iron. My brother officer of B Company, 2nd Lieutenant Gaukroger, lay opposite in a similar hole. But he was covered with earth, and no relief will ever relieve him, nor will his rest be a nine days rest. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. Sunday, 18th March, Casualty Clearing Station 13. I am in a hospital bed for the first time in my life. Last night I was going round through pitch darkness to see a man in a d d d d dangerous state of exhaustion and I fell into a c c kind of shell hole. Only 15 feet, but I caught the back of my head on the way down. The d the doctors, not in consultation, say I have a slight concussion. 
Cramped in that funneled hole, he watched the dawn open a jagged rim around, a yawn of death's jaws which had all but swallowed him stuck in the bottom of its throat of phlegm. He was in one of many mouths of hell, not seen of seers in visions, only felt as teeth of traps when bones and the dead are smelt under the mud, where long ago they fell, mixed with the sour, sharp odor of the shell. Of course I have a vile headache, but I don't feel at all fuddled. Thursday, 22nd March, Casualty Clearing Station 13. Here again. I've f felt nothing more than a headache for three days and went up to the f front. When I g g g g g got back, I developed a high fever vomited strenuously and long and was seized with muscular pain. I said the fly with my little eye. I saw his round mouth's crimson deepen as it fell like a sun in its last deep hour. Watched the magnificent recession of farewell, clouding, half gleam, half glower, and a last splendor burned the heavens of his cheek, and in his eyes the cold stars, lighting very old and bleak, in different skies. of May, Amiel. The d doctor was suddenly moved to forbid me to go back into action, <coughs> for he is nervous about my nerves, and has sent me down, labeled neurasthenia. <laughs> You know, it's not the Bosch that woke me up, nor the explosives. It was living for so long by poor old cop Robin, as we used to call Second Lieutenant Gow Kroger, who lay not only nearby, but in various places around and about. If you understand me, Suppose I've had a breakdown. I'm simply trying to avoid one.
8th August, Craig Lockett, War Hospital, Edinburgh. I am a sick man. I am a poet. I am whatever and whoever I see. Who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? Wherefore rock they purgatorial shadows? Drooping tongues from jaws that slob their relish, bearing teeth that leer like skull's teeth, wicked. Stroke on stroke of pain, but what slow panic gouge these chasms round their fretted sockets? Ever from their hair and through their hands, palms, misery swelters. Surely we have perished sleeping and walk hell? But who these hellish? These are the men whose minds the dead have ravished. Memory fingers in their hair of murders. Multitudinous murders they once witnessed. Wading sloughs of flesh these helpless wander. Treading blood from lungs that had loved laughter. Always they must see these things and hear them. Batter of guns and shatter of flying muscles. Carnage incomparable. And human squander rucked too thick for these men's extrication. Therefore still their eyeballs shrink tormented back into their brains. Because on their sense, sunlight seems a blood smear. Night comes blood black. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Thus their heads were this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness of set smiling corpses. Thus their hands are picking at each other, plucking at the rope knouts of their scourging, snatching after us who smote them, brother, pawing us who dealt them war and madness. Twenty-second August, Craig Lockett. Mother, at last I have an event worth a letter. I have benown myself to the poet Siegfried Sassoon. The sun blazed into his room, making his purple dressing gown of a brilliance, almost matching my sonnets. When I went in, he was struggling to read a letter from H.G. Wells, whose handwriting is not only a slurred suggestion of words, but is in dim pink ink. Sassoon's here, you know because he wrote a letter to the highest command that was too critical and plain-spoken. The highest command, in reply, promptly sent him here to the mental hospital for being somewhat mad. He's very tall and stately, has a fine, firm, chiselled, how's that, head, ordinary, short, brown hair, and the general expression on his face is one of boredom. He was struck with some of my war poems, and a short lyric he applauded fervently, pronounced perfect work, absolutely charming, etc., etc., and begged that I would copy it out for him to show to the powers that be. The last thing he said to me was, sweat your guts out writing poetry, Owen. Eh? says I. Sweat your guts out writing poetry, I say. So soon talks as badly as Wells writes, not slurred, pink. Thursday, September 17th, Craig Lockett. On Saturday, I met Robert Graves. He is a big, rather plain fellow. The last man on earth apparently capable of the extraordinary delicate fancies in his book. And Sassoon says you always feel better after he has gone. No doubt he thought me a slacker sort of sub. When they were together, Sassoon showed him my longish war piece. Graves was mightily impressed and considers me a kind of a find. No thanks, Captain Graves. I'll find myself in due time.
26th. Went up to town for Graves' wedding at St. James's Piccadilly. Graves strode up the red carpet wearing field boots, spurs and a sword. The bride was in no way handsome. She wore a blue check wedding dress. And Graves, pretty worked up, shouted the responses in a parade ground voice. The choir sang horribly out of tune. The reception. Wells, H.G. was there. Lord Rontha sat within reaching distance of me. George Belcher and Max Beerbohm, the most interesting people in the reception. Heinemann, the publisher, was there, and Scott Moncrief. Also, Sir Edward Marsh, private secretary to Winston Churchill. I was introduced as Mr. Owen, Pert, or even Owen the Poet. Some mention was made of securing a home base for me. Champagne was a scarce commodity, and the bride made a rush for it, saying that she was going to get something out of this wedding at any rate, and grabbed a bottle. After which she went off to change into her land girl's uniform. I wish she hadn't. Saturday evening, 19th December. Grave said to me, Don't make any mistake, Owen. You are a damned fine poet already, and are going to be more so. I won't have the impertinence to criticise. You have found a new method, and must work it for yourself. Those assonances instead of rhyme, so fine. Did you know it was a trick of ancient Welsh poetry? Or was it instinct? Tricks. If tricks... If rhyme, if assonance, if resonance of vowels make poetry, I have not succeeded. My subject is war, and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. All a poet can do today is warn. That is why the poet must be truthful. First of December, nineteen seventeen. I go out of this year a poet, my dear mother, as which I did not enter it. I am held peer by the Georgians. I am the poet's poet. First of January, nine. Last year, I lay awake in a windy tent in the middle of a vast, dreadful encampment, which seemed neither France nor England, but a kind of paddock, where the beasts are kept for a few days before the shambles. I heard the reveling of the Scotch troops, who are now dead, and who knew they would be dead. And I thought of this present night, and whether I should indeed be dead, whether you, but I thought neither long nor deeply, for I am a master of elision. But chiefly I thought of the very strange look on all the faces in that camp. An incomprehensible look, which a man will never see in England, though walls should be in England. Nor can it be seen in any battle, but only at a table. It will never be painted, and no actor will ever seize it. And to describe it, I think I must go out there again and be with them. I hear the sighs of men that have no skill to speak of their distress, no, nor the will. A voice I know, and I must go. Thirty first August in the field. And now I am at work again. Teaching Christ to lift his cross by numbers, how to adjust his crown, and not imagine that he thirsts until after the last halt. I attend his supper to see that there are no complaints. 
and inspect his feet to see that they should be worthy of the nails. I see to it that he is dumb and stands to attention before his accusers. With a piece of silver I buy him every day and with maps I make him familiar with the topography of Golgotha. You... what do you mean by this? I rapped. You dare come on parade like this. Please, sir, it's... Hold your mouth, the sergeant snapped. I take his name, sir. Please. And then dismiss. Some days confined to camp, he got, for being dirty on parade. He told me afterwards the damned spot was blood. His own. Well, blood is dirt, I said. Blood's dirt, he laughed, looking away far off to where his wound had bled and almost merged forever into clay. The world is washing out its stains, he said. It isn't like our cheeks so red. Young blood's its great objection. But when we're duly whitewashed, being dead, the race will bear field martial God's inspection. Jesus Christ I'm hit, he said, and died. Whether he vainly cursed or prayed, indeed the bullets chirped in vain, vain, vain. Machine guns chuckled, tut, 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 and the big gun guffawed. Another sighed, oh mother, mother, dad, and smiled at nothing childlike, being dead. And the lofty shrapnel cloud leisurely gestured, fool, and the falling splinters tittered. My love, one moaned. Love languid seemed his mood, till slowly lowered his whole face kissed the mud. And the bayonet's long teeth grinned. Rabbles of shells hooted and groaned, and the gas hissed. beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas. Gas. Quick, boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie Dulce et decorum est prop 
patria mori. Move him into the sun, gently. Its touch awoke him once in Wales, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Are limbs so dear achieved? Are sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir? Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh. What made fatuous sunbeams toil to break Earth's sleep at all? no word to qualify my experiences except the word sheer. It passed the limits of my abhorrence. I lost all my earthly faculties and fought like an angel. With all the dexterity of my Welsh forefathers, I ran across no man's land, dodging bullets to the right and left of me. I captured a German machine gun, and scores of prisoners. I only... killed one man with my revolver at 30 paces. The rest I took with a smile. I have been recommended for the military cross. My nerves are in perfect order. Moreover, the war is nearing an end. I dream. Kind Jesus fouled the big gun gears and caused a permanent stoppage in all boats and buckled with a smile mousers and coats and rusted every bed with his tears and 
there were no more bombs of ours or theirs. So we got out, and gathering up our plunder of pains and nightmares for the night, in wonder leapt the communication trench like flares. But at the port, a man from USA stopped us and said, Y'all go right back this minute. I'll follow. Christ, your miracle ain't in it. I'll have those rifles mended by today. 13th October, in the field. Send an English testament to his grace of Canterbury and let it consist of that one phrase at which he winks his eye. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say that he resists not evil, but whoever should smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And when he replies, most unsuitable for the present distressing moment, my dear, but I trust that in God's good time. Then, my Lord Archbishop, who thwarted a peaceable retirement of the enemy from these areas, is therefore now sacrificing aged French peasants and charming French children to our guns. Shells made by women in Birmingham are burying little children alive not very far from here. Thursday morning, before dawn, my own dearest mother, I shall call the place from which I'm now writing, the smoky cellar of the forester's house, for so thick is the smoke in this cellar that I can hardly see by a candle twelve inches away, and so thick are the inmates that I can hardly write for pokes, nudges and jolts. On my right, the company commander snores on a bench. Other officers repose on wire beds behind me. There is no danger down here. Or, if any, it will be well over before you read these lines. It's a great life. And I am more oblivious than, alas, yourself, my dear mother, to the ghastly glimmering of the guns outside and the hollow crashing of the shells. It is rumoured that Austria has really surrendered. The new soldiers cheer when they hear these rumours. The old ones bite their pipes and go on cleaning their rifles. Thank Father very much for the letter. Siegfried sent me a little book he had in France. He's been offered a job in war propaganda under Beaverbrook. He wrote to Beaverbrook's private secretary saying that he had no qualifications for such work, except that he had been wounded in the head. So glad you liked Tolstoy. I hope you are as warm as I am, as serene in your room as I am here. Of this I'm certain. You could not be visited by a band of friends half so fine as surround me here. All my dearest love, my darling mother, Wilfred. and more than Wilfred. Sir? It's 
time, sir. Company Sergeant Major. Dawn patrol for the canal. Get the men moving, please. Well done. You're doing very well, my boy. seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound, dull tunnel long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And no guns thumped or down the flues made moan. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours was my life also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair, but mocks the steady running of the hour, and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something had been left which must die now. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spoiled, or discontent boil bloody and be spilled. They will be swift, with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress to miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells, even with truths that lie too deep for taint. I would have poured my spirit without stint, though not through wounds, not on the cess of war.
I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark, for so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. There's a silver lining in the sky. One small thing, cheery old chin chin. Now put to goodbye. Little private Patrick Shaw, he was a prisoner of war. Till a hun with a gun called him Pig Dog for fun, then Paddy punched him on the jaw. Right across the barbed wire fence, the German dropped them dear old oh dear. All the wide way and Paddy held hooray as he ran for the Dutch frontier. Goodbye, goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby, dear, from your eye. Though it's hard to part. Bonsoir.